It's a pleasure to welcome Kathy Ruttenberg to the School of Art and Art History. Kathy studied at the School of Visual Arts in Manhattan and at the NYU Graduate Program in Venice. She is a leading independent New York artist working with ceramic sculpture and has had numerous solo exhibitions in Manhattan, recently including three at Stux Gallery where she is represented. Her solo show at Sledmore Gallery in London is scheduled for next year. Landscape and figure merge in her ceramic art on an impressive scale. And the result is what one might imagine if Bernini had ever met Bosch, <laughs> but with an exceptionally topical contemporary edge. Curator Charles Stuckey calls these works, quote, antique female mindscapes and critic Donald Cuspit refers to them as primal essays in the female unconscious. We are fortunate to have Kathy here in Iowa City with us today, but also especially lucky that her two-person exhibition, together with Janet Ruttenberg, is still at the Dubuque Museum of Art until March 20th. If you have not yet seen this show, I can recommend it to you highly. Kathy has unusually illustrious family ties to the University of Iowa. Her grandfather was a star Hawkeye football player in the 1920s. That is something we cannot often say about one of our visiting artists. And her mother, Janet, was in the first generation of students to study printmaking here with Mauricio Lozanski in the late 1940s. So this visit is also almost like a homecoming. Please join me in welcoming her, Kathy Ruttenberg. Thank you. Well, um, I was starting with um, this image because this is the reason why I'm here, as well as to thank John Belden Scott for his um, introduction. And this is an image of the show that um, John was just talking about with my mother in her hometown, Dubuque, where the show is still installed, as he said. And there was quite a bit of tension getting ready for this exhibition, as I had no idea how my work with my mother's work would work. And as you can see, there is quite a bit of interaction and tension um, between the work and an example of a dynamic relationship. <coughs> and so um, I wanted to base the lecture on five different categories, all important elements to creating my work, and they are failure, <coughs> process, exploration, inspiration, passion, and sub, sub um, titles as uh, with uh, passion, anything is possible, um, dream, visualize, play. Um, and I feel like failure is an important part of, um, of growing and expanding knowledge. And it is a very much a learning process and development. And um, it's a reflection of stepping out of one's a comfort zone and creating your own language. And not just working with what you've been taught, but creating your own method. Um, failure also makes me think about new resolutions. And with this piece, while I was working on it, I thought I was an absolute genius because I was using references of both porn and biblical. And technically, there were some issues. And in the end, I decided it was a very uninteresting piece <laughs> not to rebuild it. Um, so I just. Uh, go into uh, process, and this is um, uh, greenware. Oh, actually, this is this, but in greenware, um, I will build the piece to its completion. And then for technical firing, glazing, shipping, engineering, um, and more, I need to pull it apart um, to begin the bis firing. And then after all the glazes are final, then there's a reassembly process. And um, 
with this piece, I, as I was building it, this is still a piece in process, so I, I can't really show you how it has developed, but um, um, while I was working on this, somebody approached me and wants me to design a carousel with them, and I really thought about spinning, and I feel like that's something <coughs> that um, you can see in this piece. So this is a piece, this is um, greenware here, and with this piece, since it's a tile piece, this will be hanging on the wall, but I can fire it as is uh, and not have to pull it apart. Um, I can do the first firing um, and then photograph it and then put it back together with it like a map. But this is how the piece looks without the, all the um, components to it. And then I just added this because this is the fire piece, just a section, but as you can see, there's one branch here to the right that, that I forgot to fire, forgot to glaze, actually. Um, and this is also, um, to show the process, this is um, a piece um, that was just being glazed, and you can see that the design is coming to fruition on the surface here. Um, this is my, some of my palette, and that's something that um, is also part of my process, is that I just adore creating glazes and colors and textures, and it's just really one of, one of my favorite things to do. If, if nothing else, I just like have a little test kiln that I like to just check out some new colors. Um, this is a good example of all the five elements that I have referred to and the process of visualization. And you'll see also a watercolor in this. I made a few photos of this for you so you could see the process. And um, it was very much um, an attempt to actualize a vision and exploration of new solutions. The passion and determination to resolve what did not work for me as I was um, working on the piece. And um, um, as you can see, uh, as we go through this piece, there was uh, some extreme assemblage of this. And um, I really did fight, fight with this piece, but in the end, I think it was a victory because I let go and just decided to flow with the piece. This is how it was resolved. Um, there was originally, it was meant to have leaves and I just didn't work for me. I wanted her to be in a prison of trees and this is the original design there on the left and here on the right you can see, which I think is a really nice way to see the process, you can see the um, base of this piece. And this is um, a, um, a detail and I think you can also really see that I am a painter sculptor because the surfaces are very much painted and have um, all my narratives on it, which is something I'm not sure most sculptors think about. Um, and this was also um, very much um, um, developing my, this piece was, um, I think, an example of how my uh, symbolic imagery is evolving. Uh, the vagina, actual vagina is a new component. And my work has always dealt with sexuality, kind of dancing around the topic in a poetic way, but not here. And um, I just guess there's some real issues that I'm thinking about, like um, the end of reproduction, and the girl caught in a spider's web is kind of a new, a new theme for me. But now, uh, you'll see at the very end, the spider's web is definitely a theme that I've been working on and developing. Um, with this piece, I was thinking about, as I mentioned, that um, she was in a cage of flowers, which challenges the stereotype of flowers being friendly and soft. Um, like I said, which in the end I didn't think worked, so I just let go of that. And so I had uh, new solutions. Um, and also I really had to think about the stability of these uh, flowers. And um, in the end I had to cast cast the stems here. Um, um, 
And here you can see I have uh, something I call a penis plant, which um, was disturbing to me that it would seem so challenging for people. It really seemed to upset some people. But um, Charles Stuckey, who John referred to as a historian and, and uh, wrote the press release for the show, and he said the, sh the, the figure holds an arterial tube from one end of which dangles an uprooted penis and from the other end a heart, the essential remains of a love she cannot let go of, which I think gave a people, uh, people a way of seeing the piece, which um, in, in less of a challenging light. Um, and I also felt that even though this piece is um, extreme assemblage, I felt like it was a very intimate piece. It's very large, but to me, to experience this piece, it's very, very um, intimate. Um, somebody was looking at it for a building lobby and decided the piece was too challenging, which I can understand. And I refused to ch take away the penis component, so it didn't sell. It's about to be in a show that opens in a museum in Westchester, New York. So we'll see, we'll see the feedback from there. So uh, then we get to exploration. And um, one hot summer day in New York, I was having a fantasy of how it could be in a different environment. And I bought a ticket to the Antarctic. And the experience was very exciting as the world. It was a, not like nothing I'd ever experienced before. <laughs> And just so many thought-provoking issues of, for animals, the conservation, global warming. And it was just kind of a beauty that I had never, ever experienced before. And I also uh, felt like it really um, developed a new palette for me. And I could just feel the power of the ocean, which was really strong. <coughs> And uh, I got home and immediately felt the need to nosedive into my work. I was so inspired. And here is a piece that I call, I just feel like it was exploration, inspiration, passion, process, and technical. The, uh, the icebergs, um, the icebergs were uh, a little bit of a technical issue, but I love the idea of fired ice and the, to being now turned into a, a chain, as you can see, the link between the pieces of the whale tail. Um, and um, it was a hair-raising voyage across the uh, Drake Passage. And um, um, the symbolism and fantasy narrative in her hair, as you can see, and the boat is on top of her hair, you know, just trying to tell my story. Um, all of it. There was a lot to tell with this story. And um, the Weddell seal has um, fishing line for his whiskers there on the left. And, um, and on the back of her is very much an issue that is being dealt with. As you can see, this on her back is a krill. And this is what the whales eat. And it is uh, being very challenged with uh, all the conservation issues that are happening. And this is, uh, I have this under uh, inspiration. Um, this was very much, um, as you can see the date, um, an older piece. And I had a visualization and I really, it, this piece is amazing to me because I didn't really feel technically I, I was at this level, but I just feel like the, the passion was so much there to create this piece. And I also found it very interesting, too, because um, to fire this piece, I had to cut it up into sections. And I felt that the solution to that was an addition to the story, stuffing these, these um, open spaces with, with um, the, um, the inner guts of the woman. Um, and here's another angle of it. And it was, um, it, I just thought the metaphor of, of 
of, um, of this was a very poetic solution that added to the narrative. And it was kind of funny when I was working on this, I had um, buckets of veins and liver and kidney and all the bones and um, my pig got into my studio one day and knocked the bucket over and I walked in and um, all of it was strewn all over the floor so that was a funny moment. And here's another, another angle of it. And like I said, I think cutting it up um, really helped um, and stuffing the body parts into these holes I feel really added an edge to this story. And um, I just go back now to review because I feel like um, the reclining figure has been in my work for some time. This is a much older piece as you can see. And this was a cigar box and the little dog had a clay head on there. And this is another older, older piece um, that also included a reclining figure. And here is another piece. So this seems to be a theme now in my work. That's the little dog inspired that piece. And here is um, another piece that I also felt was um, uh, very much um, about what these, um, these figures are, the reclining figures. It's a passive stance that also uh, returns to the earth, a death, a change, and evolve. The female figure is earth, decay, rebirth. And this, this one um, was very much about personal experience, so I felt it was successful and really uh, exploring my psychological self. And then here is the most recent one, and um, this little character on the left was kind of how I started to visualize this piece. He was a rescue, and I really didn't need a fourth pig. I think three pigs are plenty. <laughs> but I really had to struggle with my decision not to keep him. And as you can see, he's pretty adorable. So I have him here eating my heart out, as you can see on the right. And um, I originally had an upright flower in the character's mouth and decided to, to use this tubing, as I discussed before, as a kind of narrative element, which I thought was a much more successful um, um, answer to that. And here is playing with the tubing. And I thought it was funny because I kept saying vein, I mean vine, I mean vein when I was talking about the tubing. So it, um, it is something that I really thought would go far, but I, am, I haven't used it again. And this is just to show you a little bit how pieces evolve in the studio propped up. This is a, a green pig. I'm fired. And um, also, I felt with this piece, I really <coughs> thought the presentation, as opposed to just having the reclining figure on the floor or um, on clay slabs, I thought this was an interesting solution. This is a piece of wood that I found and had uh, it finished a bit. And um, I just thought this was a fun solution to present in a gallery, the reclining figure and to give her her own space and formalize it a little bit. And this piece is definitely passion, very much so. On the left is um, my goat, who seems to have inspired many, 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 many works of, of mine. And also some bruises on my legs with his horns. But uh, here on the right is um, a piece um, that I felt was a um, just a powerful expression of my exploration of my anger and pain, but not as a victim. This was kind of um, breaking up with my husband. And the animals are really beginning to develop um, human characteristics that I use in my work. I have a lot of animals, and I feel like taking care of them really adds to my language. Um, and 
I just found this piece uh, opened the door to in my next phase of work, and it, the passion opened many doors in my brain that had pre previously been shut. Um, it just felt incredibly cathartic to make this piece, and I don't think it's ugly, which I guess um, our culture tells us should be ugly to express anger. So that was um, felt pretty successful to me. And just to show you how the, um, the animals kind of enter my work, the one on the right is the real goat. The one on the left is the clay goat. And this is just um, another uh, metaphor just that enters my work. The guy in the cage is my ex-husband, so. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I also just started really um, being fascinated with Viola Frey's work. I'm not sure if you know her work, but she makes enormous pieces, and she's a woman who was working in the 50s, and um, I just find her work incredibly powerful. There's a, a kind of a clumsiness to her enormous sculpt, her enormous figures that I find absolutely beautiful in their power. So this one is not that big, but it was big for where I was. And engineering wise, it's, it's slightly a disaster because the dogs need to be inserted as her torso needs to be inserted. So that's um, a difficult assemblage that you can hardly ask a gallery if you send this piece across the country. And also with the legs, um, I had somebody tell me that the legs needed to have cement in them, which I listened to. And as you know, cement enlarges when it, it um, hardens. So the legs cracked. So that was kind of, I had to rebuild the legs, so. And this is even a little larger, still obsessed with size. And um, um, I just uh, had a lot of fun telling my story on this piece, as you can see. And again, there is a kind of clumsiness to her that I'm aware of, but then we get even larger, and this has been my biggest peak to date. To date. It's 12 and a half feet tall, and um, the engineering behind this was just really, really exciting to me to create this piece. And um, I did have scaffolding, and there is um, a structure inside that um, Viola Lafray does not have in her pieces. Um, there is a um, metal structure inside to hold the piece together. Um, and looking at this image that I was looking at to prepare for the talk, I got incredibly inspired and thought, OK, I've got to try this again. So, and this is just, um, just kind of in the, in the studio. You can see the scaffolding on the right, the yellow scaffolding and just a detail. And then um, this is a little bit about installations. Um, this was in a florist that everybody, uh, my art advisors were very upset and wondered why I decided to show in a florist. And I just thought the beauty of the flowers and the um, availability. It was a window um, right on First Avenue that it was just a very interesting idea to see how my work looked in there. And lo and behold, the woman who lived next door ran Macy's. So she asked me to do the Macy's windows uh, for the flower show. So I did 24 windows. Um, and that was really a big, big experience. And I think um, I learned a lot by doing that. And at this point, not much seems big <laughs> after that. We were in there at night assembling, and guess what? There's rats in Macy's. <laughs> <laughs> and so then um, I was asked to do, um, this is Caramore. It's, um, it's a music place in Westchester. And I was asked to do an installation um, on their stage. And um, again, anything was small after Macy's. But this did take a lot of 
a lot of preparation and at a certain point I decided to embellish with plastic flowers um, because as you can see I was making flowers but it got really overwhelming to make each flower and I at that point I had a couple assistants helping me I would design the flower and then or the leaf and then I'd have people helping me make them and here's another I, I <coughs> each uh, I did these little islands with trees and with I these were found trees and here is Sofa Chicago, and um, this is an installation I did. And something that I feel strongly about is when I do present work, I don't want them on white boxes. I usually create a look uh, that kind of pulls the show together. And these are these metal bases that I um, had fabricated, I designed and had fabricated. And I think all of this. Um, all that what I've done in the past helps uh, create the capacity to do something on this scale. This was um, last year um, at um, the uh, Botanical Garden in Rhode Island, and it was just an incredible opportunity. They gave me this huge plot of land, and I had a real idea what I was going to do. Even I knew there was water there, but I didn't know that there was going to be this um, kind of historical structure, the fountain being there. I, I said, well, you're not going to move that? And the lady said, are you kidding? So she said, just pop your sculpture on there. And I got very upset and called her back in an hour. And I said, I got it. It's perfect. I love it. Yes, perfect. And um, I had a lot of fun with this piece. and. The water was really a breakthrough element for me. It's almost like watching your first animation move or something. It was just really incredible to plug it in and have the fountain, fountain work. And I felt like my visualization of this really did work. The fountain heads all squirt water, which I think you saw when you walked in and saw the movie. And I just feel like... Um, you know, the exploration and the engineering and the passion, it was all the elements that I talked about. It was very exciting. Here's some more shots of it. So I just go back quickly to show you where I began, and I'm uh, just going to run through quickly a chronological order of historic uh, pieces and I was uh, working on these sculptures as I was uh, painting and I think it was just um, kind of re represents a playful whimsy. I think you can um, see even in the 80s that I was approaching sculpture with a painter's mind and um, these mediums are very fragile and not durable. It's paper mache and water soluble clay that you can't fire, but I still think it opened doors in my mind to be doing this kind of work. And then um, my work kind of, uh, I wasn't really aware of Joseph Cornell at that point, but in retrospect I feel like um, I must have seen Cornell or thought about Cornell having been uh, exposed to, to his work at some point. And again, these were made with uh, water soluble clay and paper mache but I was actually building my paintings and here uh, I lived right in front of the San Gennaro festival which is a enormous festival a street festival that was in, right in front of my studio and here is another painting from that period I was um, beginning to to work with ceramics at that point and this was my final painting before I, it's called the final moment for a reason. This is the last painting I did in New York City and then I sold my studio and moved upstate to do ceramics. And moving to the country was a kind of a new beginning for me. And here's an early piece where um, I, um, got a taxidermy deer and covered it with paper pulp that had no sizing so it shrank up against 
the deer and placed a clay figure on top and the boxes on the bottom are ceramic. And here's another early piece just beginning to develop. By this point I had my own kiln and um, had stopped working at Greenwich House. I had started Greenwich House in New York and here's another where I took a, a ceramic chair and had it cast in metal for strength and this was a wall piece here. And here is another early piece and just this is a pretty big piece and as you can see the boat, can you see where the break, the break up of the boat is right there to so get things in the kiln, making things in pieces. And then um, I split up with my husband <laughs> and the work takes another change. Um, and I, I was heartbroken and I felt like this work really uh, helped me uh, express what I was going through. And here's some more um, topsy-turvy. Um, um, on the left was going to be a giant upside-down figure and I got to a certain point and I said, okay, well, I guess, I guess you could get the idea and filled it with, topped it off with the intestines and it's still a pretty strong piece. Um, and I also just felt like, um, you know, uh, when you put things in fire, it just adds so much passion. And once these pieces were glazed, it just, uh, it just expressed the strong feelings I was going, um, I was going to need to express at that point. And here is another piece um, uh, that the figures begin to take on these animal qualities and. Um, the narrative on the dress um, really begins to develop and um, the animals that are prey are women and the animals that are predators because the, she's a bird and the men seem to be the females are prey and the men seem to be more predators in the language. There's always a rat that's my ex-husband on the bottom there and the <laughs> The cage also <coughs> becomes a metaphor, and um, and I thought the flowers, like I was explaining the flowers on the more recent piece, I thought the flowers, these metal stems, have a funny edge to them, not very flower-like. Um, in case you're getting bored, this is my pig <laughs> eating his dinner, <coughs> and. Then um, this, um, I start playing, these are hanging pieces where the legs dangle and they're kind of quick pieces that I can do. They're small and they're just fun little studies for, for uh, larger imagery. And uh, I do a lot of these pieces, I still do. They're just um, really uh, quick, fun and like I say, a lot of a lot of um, notes to myself, like you can see the blue heart, that's kind of something that uh, happens in some of these pieces. And I, I really like the way the, um, the, the, the little balls dangle down and I can hang some other uh, components to the piece. Um, and here's another, um, piece where I feel like um, there's a lot of passion and um, the women, the, I decided to make the woman um, just dangle so in, instead of clay I had to use some fabric there and to just give the female more of a feeling of just being just dead in his arms and um, I was, this was, um, I was seeing somebody after being married and it just, this is how it felt. It just felt so nice to be with somebody that I trusted. So, and here is a little bit more of, of detail there. But uh, I just felt it was very successful for the way she hung in his arms. 
Uh, originally, the piece was out of clay, and I didn't like uh, the way it felt, so I redid the figure in his arms. Thought that that really worked well. And this is um, a piece that I did. I went to um, Madagascar and ended up making this piece. And this piece was actually ended up in the Korean biennial, and they, um, they bought the piece. And this is a large lamp that is a sculpture, and again, all my imagery um, on the piece. And this is where I use the technique as well um, of the dangling pieces off the dress, which I thought was very successful. And um, I had been to India, as I think you can see in this piece. And this is called Half a Man, <laughs> and just more um, play with uh, that expression. Still working out my personal issues, as you can see. Um, and this is also um, some pieces that really expressed. I had some um, physical issues, and I felt very powerless. So I felt like these that really expressed what was going on. And these pieces, I uh, play with casting plastic, and the, so the heads light up. And these are also little pieces that hang on the wall. And this was a breakthrough piece for me in kind of the psychological narrative and the symbolic language. Um, the figure here becomes a tree. And this felt very, I just felt like bingo. I, I hit it. This is where I am now. I, I was a rabbit, and I developed into different, different things, a bird, but now I'm a tree, and it just, this was really the beginning of uh, something for me. This was um, a little watercolor that I did for somebody that he wanted to give his wife, and I just thought it was a lot of fun. It was an etching that I water, put watercolor over. And um, some lady asked me to take care of this owl on the left that had been hit by a car. And I was really unsure about, about the story, but I took care of him for her for a while. And so the owl enters into my language. Really very fascinating animal. And this is a very large, this is not one of the small wall pieces. I wanted to see how how a life-size wall piece um, could feel, and um, the metaphor of me as a tree um, was uh, really uh, an anthropomorphic element that, as I said, just feel, felt really true to where I was. And then here I am, a tree dancing with the, the goat man here. And um, this is a large piece. Um, I'm beginning to play with uh, making wallpaper, which is this big drawing behind. And the tree became heavy, so I cast the legs just uh, for strength. So his feet and her legs are cast metal. And as you can see, the tree is made in pieces, and um, they really do dance, these two. And this, um, here's my life as a fairy tale. You see this walking through the woods, right? <coughs> and this is more kind of of the same, same um, feeling. And continued. And then I was asked to be part of this artist in residence um, in India uh, for protect <coughs> protecting tigers. And um, it was called Artists for Tigers. And um, um, 
And um, I had a lot of fun with this piece. Her headdress was, um, I thought, fairly successful. Another piece from that same period. And then I had a friend who was pregnant, and I thought the only thing she could give birth to was a horse. She was very horsey. And so that kind of was the beginning of the inspiration for this piece. On the left is a little horse that I rescued at about the same time. And so I was fascinated with blue eyes. The, horse, the horses all have blue eyes. And uh, I think it's interesting because the textiles were more black and white, but the firing was not. So um, one opens a kiln and thinks, oh, how did that happen? And then in the end, uh, I usually fall in love with whatever strange things happen in fire. I call it uh, fire, earth, and air, like a very, t uh, very strong cocktail, emotional cocktail. And here is just her giving birth to a Horse. And this is a more recent piece. Um, the tree is growing out of the abdomen of the woman. And this is just kind of uh, another re uh, uh, reoccurring theme. And um, it just seemed like a natural evolution of where the work was going. And I also like thinking of the rabbits flying over the tree as opposed to birds or something, as you see here. And it looks like a mouse. It's a strange um, optical illusion, but it, if you look closely, it is an owl inside the tree. And here I um, um, begin to think about um, sculptures as a holding a monitor with uh, animation, but then I got offered this show that was a really uh, interesting show because um, it was opening a space on 57th Street, and so I needed to, to resolve these uh, cavernous spaces in the dresses and decided to make them light boxes. And, um, and, um, this is a piece that also has a cast plastic rabbit on the back, which I play with the lighting. And um, this is where I was using the tubing again here, to like a connective uh, technique. And obviously it plays with the theme of this um, piece, no strings attached, when we know everything's attached. And this is another detail of the piece. And the breasts, you can see, um, I think a lot about their vessels of life, female sexuality, mother's milk. There's a lot to think about. So that's just kind of emphasizing that. And there's a detail of the light box. This is another piece of that same period, and I'm really, really happy with this piece. This piece um, kind of led me to where I am now. Um, the, uh, like I say, it's just amazing how the tube adds so much uh, narrative. It's just interesting, like the chain or, or the tubing just adds so much to the narrative and how, how it's used. And I thought this was also funny because um, 10 years out, I'm totally over my husband and I swallowed the rat. You see the tongue coming out of her mouth? I mean, the tail coming out of her mouth. That's uh, the rat. He's done. Um, and that's a little more detail. The, the, in, the, the inside story is, is um, really something I want to play with. And that's a detail. And so uh, we get to, um, um, I go to 
both the polls, as I mentioned, in 14 and 15, 2014 and 15. And here is a watercolor sketch that I did in the Arctic. Sorry, Antarctic. And so then this is a cast plastic iceberg. And it was just really so exciting to be in the Antarctic. I just kept visualizing sculptures every minute I was there. It was just unbelievable. And here is on the left from the Arctic and on the right from the Antarctic. This is a smaller piece, and I just had so much, I was just having so much fun with this. And here's some more. So I also had this idea, which I haven't actualized yet, but I love the idea of calling uh, this one ocean where I would have the two worlds connected. The, um, tropical world and the Arctic world, which is really where we're at in time with conservation. This is a recent watercolor when I was recently in Costa Rica. And this is a tapestry of uh, watercolor that, um, that um, I recently uh, had fabricated for a show, and it's really amazing they do this now um, with digital technology. So you basically hand them a watercolor and they just produce a tapestry. We are definitely in a different era. And this was for a um, a elephant. Uh, it was for Lewa, which is a uh, actually a rhino. Um, protection um, conservation group, but um, with all that's going on with the elephants, they asked me to participate in um, an auction. And uh, this is a piece I fabricated. It's it's fairly small. The guy's made out of paper, um, but the gun is ceramic that hangs off a chain off the ceramic elephant. And uh, this was a commission that I did this past summer and for a couple that was getting married they wanted the owl and the pussycat and I had so much fun with this piece and just so much fun. The, the head in the back of the piece is, um, 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 I just did the, the, the their, uh, I have photographs of the characters and I just um, then put a decal of their photograph in the back so in her back is a decal of him and in his back a decal of her. And that was, just to have these two figures dancing was really kind of a technical, uh, technical uh, challenge, but I was very happy with how it turned out. And just some fun kind of small pieces. I just had, had sold all the small pieces, and so I just went about building some small pieces, which of course is, always gives me ideas. This piece I want to do is a fountain piece, so it would be a lot of fun to have her standing in water, and this is a small piece here. And this is right now, we're almost done, John. Is this too much? We're almost done. Okay, this is um, what I'm working on now. The, the hole in the tree, as you can see on the right, that's going to house some animation. And on top is a, um, uh, this is just, um, a design that I used to develop this idea and um, we had this uh, piece digitally scanned and a foam made uh, the right size and here's the foam and here it's fitted on top of the tree. I want her to be like wind, or kind of like the essence of air and uh, this is animation. And, well, this is actually what I'm animating. It's uh, going to be rotoscoped. So this is a, a 
spider, can you see the spider? I'm rotoscoping that now. So the tree becomes, um, the tree becomes um, kind of um, a vehicle to hold a monitor. And these were the, just the different tests for the, for the figure. The one that we'll be using will be the clear one on the left. And this is um, a fountain, a little house, house fountain that I'm working on now as well. And just this was a test to see. So she's going to be um, just a small house fountain. Just a test in my studio. And then there she is. Am I going the wrong way? Yeah, I'm going the wrong way. And, uh, just some drawings. How I get to where I am. And just some current work in progress. This is more of the light box that I'm playing with because I just ha uh, felt that it was so successful. And this is a the last piece. And this, I'll just finish with this piece. This is, um, um, I've been asked to do some outdoor work, some work in um, the streets in the city, New York City, and this is where the piece started from. And this is the back of the head that's cavernous and um, this is the study for the large piece, this piece, um, the figure on the right, the head will be, end up being about 96 inches. And um, she'll be cast resin, and then I'll build a forest inside of her, inside of there. And this is the digital scan for that. I think we've had enough, don't you? <laughs> An hour and three minutes, not bad, right? Can I ask a question? Sure. So this is a pencil drawing. Yeah. This, um, well, I decided because I wasn't sure if everybody was getting bored. That's why I ended it so abruptly. But this is wallpaper. OK, I was wondering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. great. I did show it as a drawing, but I showed it as a drawing that you could buy a digital rendering of, or you could have it in wallpaper, any size. Yeah. Any other questions? Kathy, you referred to, several times throughout, you referred to the psychological narrative. Yeah. So in pieces like uh, Impaled or Ice Age or Krill, the mermaid. Do you consider those to be self-portraits? Uh, yeah. Yes, I do. Um, I feel like everything is autobiographical for me. That, you know, I just feel things and then it kind of goes through my body and then I express it. And that's why I just felt so excited about being in the Antarctic because it just, it just felt so you know, that my language was coming out, that I didn't need to live it and then process it and think about it. I was there and I just, I kept visualizing pieces. Like, it's so amazing, you know. I was in this room that I was sharing with other people and it kind of became my art studio. <laughs> so I really went crazy, did a lot of watercolors while I was there. So it was a really exciting trip. That's it? Can I, this may be a little off subject, but I was just curious about, um, I mean, it's just the talk was great, it worked. Just was so, it? Yeah, I, I thought it was boring, was everybody. So the work. I mean, there's all, I could, I will, I could go on. Okay, so oh, thank you. That. But I, I did, I was curious about. Um, Should I finish the torture? No. Yeah, yeah. finish it. <laughs> I was just curious about, um, also, like, you know, growing up with a parent who is an artist, yeah. and then now, you know, like, being 
both adults, and I'm, I'm so curious, like, what are your studio visits like when you visit each other's studios? It's like she is so funny because um, I said I'd love to come by and see what you're working on. Oh no, the nothing, nothing, really. There's nothing happening. So boring, she'll say. Yeah. And um, I live kind of uh, fairly remote upstate, and um, it's good because I don't have many visitors. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I have quite a few. Yeah, I have quite a few. Uh, well, we don't know each other well enough. Um, <laughs> that's um, I, when people ask me how many animals I have. Are almost like one could be the other, like the interchangeability of that, yeah. and then attached to the figure, the human figure. Yeah. You know, I, that progression of being. Really it's really, it's really, uh, it's like felt it. really important to me, and yeah. it's, it's. Thank you for noticing that. I tried to show that. That's why I did the year, the chronological year to year, and so it, it's, um, it just really feels like it's my language. So it's really feels very authentic to me. So, uh, and I, I rushed through a little bit just because um, I didn't want to keep you too long. It was a lot of images, but there's one where she's holding the iceberg in front of her face, and I felt like I became an iceberg, you know. It's just really, really um, interesting how to feel these, these um, anthropomorphic concepts. I, I was wondering um, if you've ever done the cast glass, if you're interested in that as opposed to I glass. tried. It's hard. Yeah. I, I tried, and I wasn't, I wasn't that happy with it. Um, but yes, I think it's something that I would like to try again at some point. It's very, very technical. Yeah. And um, I don't like the plastic, but the plastic is really, really interesting. You know, it's quick, it's light, and... Um, it's also less, um, it's, it's, you know, the glass, you have to leave it in a kiln for days to cool. So that's like um, a little bit for me, a little bit of a conservation question mark. I, I um, have uh, like seven kilns of different sizes because I like to fill kilns very full. So um, like if I do a textile kiln, you know, just, it's just like this big. So it fires with uh, very minimal electricity. So. Thank you. Beautiful. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Kathy? Thanks so much. Oh, thank you.